Stephen, welcome to our program, uh, Conversations. It's a great privilege to have you with us. Thank you. Uh, for, the, for the interview, I was rereading some of your poems, and, and, and you get this enormous sense of uh, being, as it were, a co-discoverer with you rather than, than tutor. Uh, at, at, at a ripe 79. <laughs> do you still feel a discoverer? Oh yes, I do. Because I think that uh, any kind of writing, you, you have a vague idea of something you want to write and then you have to discover what it is you're trying to say. So if people ask me, well, what are the themes of your poetry, which people often ask here, I say, I don't really know. I don't have any themes. I try to discover them. You're a poet primarily, though you've, you've been a, a writer, a critic, playwright. Uh, let's look at your poetry to start with, perhaps. Why are you a poet? What is it about poetry that excites you? Why do you write poetry? I think when I was eight years old, which is during the First World War, our family was evacuated from the East Coast, which was being bombed by Zeppelins, uh, to go to the Lake District in England which was where Wordsworth wrote his poetry and where he lived most of his la life. And um, we were children, I was eight, I think. But after we were supposed to go to bed, my parents used to read each other the poems of Wordsworth on the lawn outside below our bedroom window. And I think that's when I decided I wanted to be a poet, or that's when I first got the idea of being a poet. And you were published by the time you were 21. Yes, I was, yes. Well, I think that was partly because uh, as I, at the age of 21, that would be 12 years after the end of the First World War, and I think that there was a kind of gap because the writers who then should have been 40 or, 50 or 30 or 40, unfortunately had been killed in the First World War. So there was, uh, publishers and editors were looking for young writers. So it was not so difficult to get published then. You mentioned that um, poetry was a process of, of discovery for you and that it was the influence of Wordsworth and, and, and your parents reading poetry to you. But what is it about poetry that excites you as opposed to, to writing a novel or, or something else? What, what's unique about that experience? Well, I'd also like to write a novel. Uh, in fact, I just, just have written a novel. Uh, but again, I think it's really asking yourself, can, can you do something? And it always seems enormously difficult to do, because you seem to be having to do so many things at once. You're trying to say something, uh, you're trying to find images in which to say it, you're kind of trying to find the right language, you're trying to put it all within a form. It's like any kind of rather intricate uh, piece of work. I mean, I imagine like making a watch or something like that. How, how, how does the process happen? Is it, is it a flash of inspiration, a, a form of words, an image? Where does it begin? What are the sort of recesses of, of the mind that get triggered? Well, I think that um, inspiration is, a, is, is not really peculiar to poetry. I mean, if you say you're a photographer and you wake up in the morning and think, well, I really want to do a beautiful photograph of something that I saw yesterday and I want to get the light exactly right and I want to get the timing exactly right and so on. That is an idea that comes to you which you want to fulfill and put into practice and you have at the end, you have the idea that at the end you'll see the finished photograph and will the finished photograph live up to your expectations? Will the photograph, as it were, see what you saw? Does it start with the idea or, uh, of, of having something to say, or does it start with, with a turn of phrase? Or I think it starts with a turn of phrase, really. Uh, perhaps a turn of phrase which corresponds to some memory or some experience, something immediate. It's rather like uh, Freud says about dreams, that any, in any dream, a uh, part of the dream is something that happened yesterday, is immediate, to do with an immediate in insight. And, but part of it goes right f very far back into your childhood, you see. And I think in that way poems are, are rather like dreams. Much of your work is, is intensely personal, even though it's set in a, in, in, in a larger political landscape, if I may put it that way. And uh, you did react strongly to the, to the impact of the, of the war 
in, in yes. your growing up years. And, and, that, and, and people would argue that that was perhaps your most sort of powerful, meaningful, significant poetry written at that time. Would you say that, that, uh, that your, your political beliefs uh, may have uh, motivated or, or been the catalyst for some of your writing? Well, it was uh, during the Spanish Civil War, uh, but, but when fascism was very strong in Europe, and I was very strongly anti-fascist. And there was sort of pressure on us to be anti-fascist because uh, the government of England was not particularly anti-fascist, so that opposing Hitler in 1932 or 1936 or so uh, was something that individuals did and the government sort of lagged behind, rather thinking, well, after all, Hitler may turn out to be a perfect gentleman, English gentleman, something like that. And so then a great deal of one's emotional and even physical energy uh, was taken up in that, and that also affected my poetry. I mean, I started writing poetry about the things that I was doing and seeing and feeling at that time. It was almost fashionable for, for educated um, English students at Oxford and Cambridge to be radical left uh, communist. Uh, were you uncomfortable with the label communist? Well, I only w uh, during the short time I wore it, which I think was about 10 days or a month at the outside, I was rather pleased with it. Uh, but I was uncomfortable with it afterwards because I found I didn't agree with them at, uh, about a lot of things. They didn't agree with me either. And then it did become a label which sort of tagged on, on to you. And it had consequences like when, when I uh, first wanted to go to America, I couldn't get a visa and things like that because I'd been a communist for 10 days, <laughs> that, uh, 10 years previously, you know, that sort of thing. So in that way, it was uncomfortable. Um, it's a bit it, 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 it now a bit embarrassing because I think it never I wouldn't mind at all if it really reflected what I had ever really thought. I mean, I joined rather on an impulse, and partly because the communists told me uh, that the, the secretary of the English Communist Party then uh, t told me that uh, the communists were trying to have members who were not communists. They were trying to become much more democratic and you didn't have to be a strict party liner then to join the party. I always wonder whether they were sincere about that, and I w in fact, whether during the 1930s there wasn't a kind of Titoism going on in the English Communist, and perhaps the European Communist parties. You mentioned that there were some aspects of them that you, you were enamored by and some that you, you didn't entirely agree with. What, what were some of these things? Well, they were very, st I mean, they, they were very idealistic. They were, uh, they were what's called starry-eyed. And I think, I don't know, a friend of mine was discussing the other communism the other day and saying, well, today there are no starry-eyed communists. There may be communists for intellectual reasons and so on. But in the 1930s, uh, communists were, were religious, really, and you were there because you had this sort of burning faith and you were very impressed by the fact, that perhaps not so much by your own faith as by that of your comrades. And in fact, uh, during the Spanish Civil War, even the very tough communists uh, were people who one respected and who were human. I mean, maybe if they'd ever got into power in England, they'd have proved quite inhuman and been sort of dictators, I don't know. But when they were young, except when they were young, uh, the, the communists who turned out to be dictators in Czechoslovakia and different countries, they, they were probably starry-eyed youths. Are you, are you attracted to the dialectical processes of Marxism and, and the dial Marxist dialectics? I am in a way, because I think Marxism is a very valuable experience and phase to have gone through, because Marxism does tell you one or two simple things such as that everyone is an interested party and that everyone is thinking when they talk about econ economics or so on, that really thinking, how does this benefit me? And if you, you, if you are a communist, you may set yourself completely against this and saying, you may be saying to yourself, as I certainly said to myself when I was a communist, of course, 
if they ever get into pie, I don't know where I'll be. I'll probably be a crossing sweeper or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so that I knew I was not being a communist because it served my economic interests. But now, of course, I know that in my opinions about politics, it's distinctly a factor to think, well, if a Labour Party gets into power in England, will I be worse off, my, I myself personally? And I think that kind of self-criticism, that realizing that you represent your own economic interests and your opinions, I've really got from Marxism. And I often notice when people are talking about politics, say at a dinner party or something, I think, well, he doesn't know why he's talking like that. He's really talking like that because he's director of a company or, or something like that, you see. And I see this very, very clearly. And I think this is due to my having been through this sort of Marxism ideological period. How do you react to what's happening, say, in, in the Soviet Union and Perestroika and Glasnost? Well, I'm absolutely de delighted. I mean, I thought it would be impossible I, I used to think, when I was young and no longer communist, I used to think, well, will I ever live to see any change in Moscow? And then I decided, uh, no, I won't. And when um, the great Russian poet Akhmatova uh, came to London, I think in the 1870s or something, I went to see her. And then I think Bulganin and Khrushchev were the, the heads of the Soviet Union. And so I said, well, do you think things are going to get better? And she shook her head and she said, no, things will never get better in my lifetime. And I said, why do you say that? And she said, you have no realization of how slowly things go in Russia. So I thought, well, uh, it'll be after my death, perhaps. And then suddenly this has happened and there are these great changes. Of course, one feels very nervous about them because uh, who knows whether Gor we won't open the newspaper tomorrow morning and see that Gorbachev has been thrown out by the military or something like that. If one were to try and, and, and sort of dare to put a political label on you, where would you place yourself? How would you describe yourself? Well, I'm, I should say I'm left-wing, but I think that's very, uh, but I'm very detached from it all. The only thing is that I am definitely not right-wing. I mean, I can't imagine uh, uh, voting for the Conservatives in England uh, simply because they are reactionary and simply because they don't seem to care about uh, uh, children's <laughs> meals in school or about education for that matter uh, or about the health service uh, to the extent that the Labour Party do. So I would distinctly be on the left, yes. How important has, has discipline been for you? Well, I think discipline, I've had far too little discipline in my life, looking back at my life in old age. I think, well, again and again in my life, when I should have been writing, I did something else, either out of, because I wanted to amuse myself, or because I, because I didn't stick to one thing, one subject, or because I needed to make money and I felt I must make money, because I needed it very badly. And uh, it all adds up to lack of discipline, I think. And I, I've never studied anything really seriously. I mean, I've studied a lot of things, but I've never, say, thought to myself, well, I want to read Tolstoy. If I think I want to read Tolstoy, I read a few things by him. I don't mean by that I will sit down and spend six months and I will read everything that Tolstoy ever wrote. That's what I'd call discipline. And I don't have that, I'm afraid. You were also contemporaries with uh, W. H. Auden and, and uh, McNeese yes. uh, at Oxford. Yes. Uh, what was the interaction like between, say, three great poets? What did it mean for um, you? Well, it was very warm. I mean, I was extremely uh, attached to Auden and knew him very well. I really knew him very well from Oxford to, until the day he died and he frequently came to stay with us in, in London. And uh, at a, I didn't meet him immediately at Oxford, but when I did get to know him, uh, we would be together a lot. I'd, we'd have meals together, we'd go out walks in the country together, that kind of thing. 
What was the nature of the interaction? Did you uh, comment on each other's work? And yes, we showed each other uh, each other's work, uh, but he was two years older than I, and of course that makes a great difference if he's 23 and you're 21, or, or rather he was 21 and I was only nine, 19. Uh, and apart from that, he was much more talented, I think, and was much the most talented of the poets of that generation. So he had a kind of ascendancy uh, over me, and so I was always in the position of admiring his poems and not really being able to say anything critical about them because I didn't, I didn't even understand them well enough to criticize them. They are, in fact, very difficult, the early poems. And I was like a sort of uh, student whom he was telling things. I mean, he'd read a poem and he'd say, well, that line's very good. The rest is lousy. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, Do you look back at some of your earlier work and wish you could change it, or it, it wasn't there in print? Oh, I do quite often. I think that all all poets do. Yes, because I remember very well the circumstances in which I wrote it, and I see that perhaps even there's something that I've forgotten to put in, so that I have a strong desire to change early things. Are you meticulous about maintaining drafts, and do you have a sort of consciousness of history in a sense that, say, Yeats had? I do, yes. I, yes, I, well, I mean, for, there's one strong reason for uh, retaining drafts, and that is that you can sell them. <laughs> so that you have, as a Marxist, I can uh -huh. say you have an economic interest in, uh -huh. in saving drafts. Uh -huh. Have you read much of the Indian writing in English? I haven't read very much, no. Um, I mean, I, I, I know the, the novels of Naipaul and Salman Rushdie and so on. Um, I really only know well the poems of Don Moraes, because I met Don Moraes when I first came to India, when he was only 16 years old, I think. He showed me then his poems, which I thought were very, very exciting, really. And Salman Rushdie is in all kinds of trouble, uh, even in Britain. Uh, a major, major retailer of books has withdrawn his books from the shelves. Uh, he's been banned in several countries. Um, and and, and he, as, as a communist, you've in some measure experienced discrimination yourself. What is your view on, on, on something like that? Um, well, my view, I haven't read his book, so I can't really express a view about what he, what he said on this particular, what he but wrote. the principle of it. In principle, I think it's very bad of W. H. Smith, the retailer, who have taken his books off from his shelves. I can see their different difficulties, because they have dozens of branches, and they're very vulnerable, I suppose, to attack. But I'm thoroughly against censorship. I, I think, I'm, think I'm even against censorship on racial lines. I mean, the kind of thing you know that in well in England we're very strong on racism, and I believe that if you make, uh, you can be sued for making a r racist remark or writing a racist remark. Actually, arising from this Rushdie thing, I was wondering whether I even agreed with that because I think that uh, the things that people feel, it's better that they're put in print and uh, and uh, exposed. Uh, than that they sort of brood in pe people's minds. Uh, and I, a founder, or one of the founders of a magazine called Index on Censorship, which is uh, devoted to attacking censorship. Usually we attack it when it happens in Czechoslovakia, uh, or, some, or Russia, or Poland, or South Africa. We attack it a great deal in South Africa, Latin America, and so on. But it seems to me that it's beginning to become, there's beginning to be a kind of censorship in Eng England too. And we did have a number, really, about England recently, in which we pointed out all the threats to liberty and the threats of censorship which are going on in England. So that on general lines, um, I would think it very bad to censor Rushdie's book. But I don't know if I'd actually read the passage and it turned out to be racist. Uh, then I'd, I'd have you've read it, you know perhaps. Uh, then I'd have to think very hard about it. So what what would be a circumstance under which you would consider censorship legitimate? Um, 
I suppose <laughs> if someone wrote saying murder, murder all the Jews or murder all the Hindus or murder all the Muslims or something, I think that, in a certain form, I think that should be subject to censorship. I'm never sure about pornography. I mean, in a way, I think censorship on grounds of pornography is, is always rather bad. It's always, it's always based on the idea that a child might read this and it might get uh, do damage to the rest of the life of the ch child or something like that. But actually, I'd rather doubt whether it would do that amount of damage to, to the child. And also, I think that if you base what you publish on the standards of what children should be allowed to read, uh, that's very, very bad. And for instance, on TV, it would have devastating effects. We're having a dis big discussion about it with regard to TV. I think that now uh, f movies which are uh, in which people are physically exposed, sort of stark naked or something like that, are only allowed after midnight, mm -hmm. assuming that children are in bed by midnight, which is not at all necessarily the case in England, mm -hmm. given what English families mm -hmm. are like. Mm -hmm. You were editor of Encounter uh, and, and had a long tenure with that magazine. What was the philosophy of Encounter and, and, and what brought you to that experience? Well, Encounter was an American magazine uh, published in England. I always knew that. And when, when we started Encounter, an American-funded magazine, I always insisted that we must have an American ex editor who was co-equal with the English editor, and that we must have on the title page that it was published by the Congress, it was paid, published by the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which was an American organization. And uh, within, within those limits, it was a very free magazine. I mean, it was an excellent magazine, and we could we could we were perfectly free to, to publish what whatever we liked. But I think there were certain. I think we would not have published. In fact, I'm sure we would not have published, say, a communist attack on the United States or something like that. But then I would not have published that anyway, even if the magazine had been paid for by an English foundation or by an English publisher. This is your third visit to India. What impressions do you take back with you? Well, I've only been here for four days. One impression, talking about English, which I would like to record, is that I've come here, of course, to this play, Creon, which is going round, and with a company of English actors and actresses. And it's impossible to tell you, because people won't, here won't quite believe it, how impressed they are by their Indian audience. They're really absolutely over the moon about it. And they say that the English, the Indian audience listen so attentively to the lines, uh, they pick up subtleties which the English audience completely ignored, that the actors themselves have become aware of these subtleties reverberating back from the audience and that it's transformed their, uh, they feel that it's transformed their own acting, and they've discovered possibilities in the play and in their performance of it, which they wouldn't have thought possible. They told me this today. Can you bear to sit through a performance of a play that, that you've written and is, is being performed? What goes on in your head? Um, <laughs> once I sat through a performance of a play I'd written and I nearly fainted with horror. I thought it was so terrible, <laughs> both the writing and the performance and everything, and I had to leave the theatre, mm -hmm. because I thought it, an author couldn't sort of be reported as fainting with horror at his <laughs> own play. I feel, as a matter of fact, if I see Creon performed the same day as Julius Caesar, I do feel rather unhappy, because I do think this miraculous language of Shakespeare, and I start feeling ashamed of my and, uh, and noticing differences and feeling ashamed of my own language. But as they do it now, uh, in fact, I've, I've it, 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 really, since I've been in India, I would like to see it much, m my own play much more. I suppose that's also partly because of the Indian audience and because the actors seem to be picking up things uh, which they didn't do in England. They were only acting in the English, in English provinces. It hasn't been performed in London. 
uh, but the audience here really is ten times, they, they'd probably say a hundred times better. You've uh, been quoted as saying that, that uh, you, you see the greatest problem confronting mankind uh, is poverty uh, rather than nuclear annihilation or, or superpower rivalry. What is the solution? What, what, what do you see is, is the philosophical uh, shift, uh, shift in ideology, in policy that might handle the problems that, that, that confront us? Um, well, I think that's why I say poverty, because it does seem the most insoluble of, of these uh, problems. And also the most horrifying, because after all, uh, hydrogen war and so on is only a threat, it's only in, in the background. But I've just been reading a book by uh, someone called Geoffrey Morehouse called Calcutta, and I've been reading about the uh, terrible slums, or worse slums is a rather it's, it's not a good enough name or bad enough name for them, for conditions of poverty in, in Calcutta. And it's really terrible to think that at this moment there are these people living in a sort of stew, really, of, of misery. And, uh, and I, don't, I don't know what the solution is, but in this conference which I've been attending uh, about the world uh, the world uh, citizen. Uh, worth citizen. Uh, fortunately, they are very good scientists and also very good men from the World uh, Health Org Organization and so on. Uh, they do seem to think that if we were prepared to sacrifice a certain amount and devote enough attention to it, uh, these problems are sol sol soluble. But I do think that I would think it's also true that. Asia and Africa, I suppose, to some extent remain Malthusian countries. That's to say that if you raise the standard of, li of, of living uh, to a certain extent, the, pop the, the population simply increases correspondingly. And so you just have more people being, being miserable, absorbing the new possibilities of just being, uh, having just a, a, a standard of feeding which can uh, keep you alive. So I do think that some attack on the problem of population uh, must also accompany uh, attempts to improve conditions. I don't know at all how that has to be done. <laughs> You've done, uh, you, you must have done sort of hundreds of interviews in, in, in your long career as, as, as a public figure. Is there a question that you wish you had been asked and weren't? No. <laughs>